Well, so of course, a note of thanks to Keith for inviting me to speak here today. I was at the Mountain Pine Beetle session that was held in this room a year ago, and I thought that was a great event, and I'm looking forward to this being even bigger and better. And I wanted to say thanks to Fran, like everybody else has said, thanks to Fran for uh, making the accommodation arrangements. That has been um, very helpful, and I have to say I'm very impressed with the level of organization that Keith and Fran have brought to the meeting. Um, so what I'm going to try to do today is kind of set the scene for all the uh, other talks that you're going to be listening to today. I'm going to kind of provide an overview of uh, threats to the western boreal forest with an emphasis on climate change, but not exclusively climate change. And the idea here is to kind of whet your appetite for the more detailed talks that are coming up afterwards. But I'd like to start with a quotation from one of the best known climate scientists that uh, most of you will probably be familiar with. And that is, the future ain't what it used to be. And of course, you know, it goes without saying that uh, things are going to be changing in the future. But I think the reason I want to emphasize this is because the natural human inclination is to assume that tomorrow is going to be like yesterday. And I think most of us who work in this area are pretty convinced that that isn't the case. And so we really need to start thinking about what uh, climate change and other impacts of industrial development and other things are going to be bringing to us in the form of the forest, but also in the form of how we manage the forest and how we may need to change our practices in order to accommodate those changes. So what I wanted to start with here is really a global view of potential tipping points around the world. This is from a, a very interesting paper that I highly recommend. It was written 10 years ago, so it's not really current, but at the same time it identifies an issue that I think is, is really important and provides the theme for, I think, what's, what's going to be uh, talked about over the next couple of days. So this idea of a tipping point is the point at which a system, a complex ecological system in our case, is, is at a point in which a little bit more stress causes it to shift into a different state. So for example, in the boreal forest, we're all familiar with the southern edge of the of the boreal, which is not very far away from here and is not very far away from where I live in, Sas in Saskatoon. And that southern edge of the boreal is subject to drought events, subject to fires, subject to a lot of human interventions. And the question on the table here, again, identified by these authors, is, is that system, that boreal forest system, close to the point where a little bit of additional stress in terms of drought or in terms of more intense fires or a combination of things, is that system in a position where it may turn into something else? So these authors identify that as being a biome shift where the boreal forest may flip into a grassland or aspen parkland or something like that, which, which we're familiar with in this area. So some of the other tipping points there, the um, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, AMOC, which is the, the conveyor belt in the ocean that brings warm surface water to the northern part of Europe and brings colder water back down towards the equator. Again, a complicated system um, and with increased glacier melting and ice cap melting is that system uh, at a point where it may shift into a different state. Uh, and similarly for some of the other things that are mentioned there. But I thought it was interesting that at the global view, according to these authors at least, the boreal forest is one of these systems that may be approaching a tipping point. And of course the main thing that, that uh, I really want to focus on and continue to talk about through my presentation here is that it's a combination of factors that leads to this state. So it's not simply more fire or simply more insects or simply changes in species composition or productivity, but it's all of those things taken together that may potentially cause this system to flip into a new state. And th that, if there's one thing that I hope you would take away from this talk today, is that it's the combination, this multiple stressor type of environment that the forest exists in today that may cause this tipping point to occur. So, um, as Keith said, 
the, uh, the, the title, the overall theme of our, of our uh, session over the next couple of days is threats to, the, to Alberta's boreal forest. And I'll take exception to the word Alberta and say the Western Canadian boreal forest. Um, and th the threats out there are many and varied and you're all familiar with them. I don't need to go into a big long laundry list of what they are. But again, the point is that there are multiple threats in the environment and it's the combination of those threats that may uh, that may significantly affect the boreal forest in the future. So I don't intend to go into a lot of detail about any particular one of these items because we have a, a lot of people coming up after me that know way more about these individual events than I do, but I just wanted to give a kind of an overview of what some of those might be. And then, um, you know, you might interpret that first part of the talk as being doom and gloom. So the second part of the talk will be, and what can we do about it? So I'll, I'll have uh, maybe a, a more positive message towards the end. So as we all know, the boreal forest is primarily a fire-driven ecosystem. All of the patterns on the landscape and the processes that are occurring out there are affected by fire to one extent or another. Uh, it affects all trophic levels from the bugs and the slugs in the soil to the vegetation, to the wildlife that occurs in those areas. And so fire is ubiquitous in terms of its impact to the ecosystem. But because that's been the case for many thousands of years, the boreal forest is very strongly adapted to successfully recovering after fire. And it's a relatively rare event uh, in which fire is so severe that it really materially affects the boreal forest in the sense of it turning into something else. So the boreal forest is very robust and resilient to fire. Um, and I, so, so I don't think that fire just by itself, even if it becomes more, more common and more uh, severe, will necessarily change the character of the boreal. I mean, it will at the local level, but probably not at the, at the larger level. But nevertheless, we do expect changes in the fire regime in the future. Uh, generally speaking, a warmer and drier climate is going to drive more fires and perhaps more severe fires. You know, everybody says, oh, Fort McMurray, that's the future. Well, not necessarily. But it may be the case that those kinds of events occur more frequently in the future than they do today. So, uh, and, and of course, fires are notoriously difficult to predict. So we can't really say, well, what does that really look like in the future? Uh, there's been a lot of modeling analyses over the last 10 or 15 years for the boreal, for the Western Canadian boreal, that attempt to try to look at that but trying to put some real numbers on that is very difficult. However, uh, there, as I say, there has been a lot of work done, and some of the most recent is this piece of work by Jan Boulanger and, and uh, colleagues from the Canadian Forest Service. And in their analysis here, the upper graph shows kind of the baseline level of uh, annual area burned, uh, sorry, not the baseline level, but the ratio of future area burned to the baseline area burned, which in their case was the amount of fire in the 1961 to 1990 time period. And so the, the, the prairie boreal forest region, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, that we're all familiar with, is looking at something like a doubling to a quadrupling of area burned by the end of the century. And what's interesting about this, this is 2014, and if you go back 10 years or so, uh, to other work that has been done, Mike Flanagan and colleagues and other people like that has suggested actually very similar kinds of outcomes. So there seems to be a convergence of the research and modeling right now suggesting that these kinds of numbers perhaps are, are what we may be looking at. But, you know, the real answer is we don't really know what, what uh, to expect from fire except that there's likely to be more of it on the landscape and that we need to be aware of that and, and start taking that into account for future management planning and uh, resource allocation for suppression systems and things like that. Um, drought, we're going to hear so a lot more about this from Ted Hogg uh, coming up in a little bit. Uh, what I did a few years ago was take Ted's climate moisture index and calculate it for an area that's just east of Prince Albert in Saskatchewan called the Fort Alicorn Forest. Uh, this is a kind of an isolated island of boreal forest surrounded by agricultural land. And so it's really at the very southern extreme limit of the boreal forest in Saskatchewan on very sandy soils. So it's kind of a marginal forest environment to, to begin with. But if you look at the climate moisture index, uh, 
and you calculate it under a range of different climate scenarios, that's what the numbers at the bottom are, um, you find that under the most extreme climate scenario, the A2, which is from a, a, a previous set of scenarios, that the climate moisture index at the Fort Alicorn in 2050 is the same as the climate moisture index in swift current today, which is part of the notorious Palliser Triangle in southwestern Saskatchewan, southeastern Alberta. I don't know if any of you have been to Swift Current, but if you think about that landscape, is there a lot of forest cover? Well, no, not really. Swift Current is not known for being a forested part of the province. And so if just simply based on this climate moisture index, conditions are going to be significantly drier in the, at least the southern edge of the boreal in the future as compared to today. And similarly, um, in the 2080 time period, the climate moisture index then is the same as that in Estevan today, which is also not known for being a forested part of the province in the very southeastern corner of Saskatchewan. So drought is really, I think, one of the main issues that we are going to be looking at in the future. Um, not that there's a huge amount we can do about drought, but again, are there opportunities for adaptation in the form of drought resistant tree species or other kinds of silvicultural interventions, or planting at lower densities to reduce water use and things like that, that may be part of the toolkit coming up in the future. Uh, insects, you know, who am I to talk about insects in a room full of insect experts, so I won't go into this in any detail. We'll be hearing a lot about that coming up. But just to mention a couple of things, again, going back to this theme of multiple stressors, I think it's pretty well understood that trees that are under drought stress tend to be more susceptible to insects than otherwise. Um, we all know that there are exotic species headed our way from the east in terms of the emerald ash borer and from the west, well, they're already here, mountain pine beetle and others, and perhaps others from the south or other directions that we're not aware of yet. But because they're not native, we don't understand what their behavior is going to look like very well. And so uh, exotic insects is likely to be a part of our future in a way that's very difficult to, to predict. And of course, the native species generally don't have any resistance to exotic insects, and so that adds another layer of complexity there. Pathogens, uh, again, I am not the expert in any way about uh, pathogens and potential interactions with climate change. But yet again, just to note that Trees that are under stress for other reasons may be more susceptible to certain pathogens. But one of the difficulties with this whole uh, area is that pathogens take into account a wide variety of organisms. There may be bacteria, may be viruses, there may be fungi, there may be parasitic plants. All of those will respond to climate change in a different way. So trying to characterize pathogen response to climate change in a simplistic way is essentially impossible. The other thing that I think is really interesting here is that there are some pathogens, not all, but some pathogens are spread by vectors like insects. Uh, Dutch elm disease is maybe the, the most commonly known one. And the issue there is that you have a complicated system which involves an uh, insect vector, the disease organism, and the host organism. Each of those parts of the system are going to be affected in a different way by climate change. So how do you make sense out of a complex system like that? compounded by the fact that we don't exactly know which direction climate change is going to go in. And so the uncertainty related to uh, pathogens, particularly ones that are spread by insect vectors, is a very complicated one. Um, and so I think at this point we know that we need to pay attention to this, but what that looks like as it plays out in the future is very difficult to say. Uh, warmer temperatures are just in general likely to allow inoculum to uh, exist over winter and mistletoe again can be uh, prevented, germination can be prevented by temperatures below minus 40 or so, which of course we don't see as often anymore. And so the controlling factors in the environment that have maybe put some limits on these organisms in the past may be, may be less in the future. And I highly recommend this, this paper by Rona Sturrock, who is a CFS researcher in Victoria who did a big review of climate change and pathogens a few years ago. And this is uh, quite a, a very good piece of work if you're interested in this. <clears throat> so biodiversity, I'm a forester, I'm not a wildlife person, but 
I've been rubbing shoulders with people who do work in this area quite a bit. And uh, my colleagues in Saskatchewan often refer to that four-letter word called caribou. Um, and this is causing a lot of angst out there, both in the technical world, but also in the political world, as you are all aware of. But um, there has been, or there is starting to be at least, a lot of work related to the potential interactions between climate change, caribou, and the other critters that are out there, particularly moose and wolves. And so, for example, if moose begin to move north in response to warmer temperatures, the wolves will follow the moose, and they may incidentally take caribou as, as they go by. So these, again, interactions between different species on the landscape and changes in environmental conditions is something that uh, is starting to become a little bit more clear, but again, the, the, uh, the details of how that is going to play out on the landscape are not very well known. And then on top of that, the habitat impacts of climate change, particularly with regard to fire and to human intervention on the landscape, will also play an important role, particularly for those um, species that require older forests. Um, we also have direct impacts of climate change, like heat stress on moose. And so this combination of factors, uh, once again, is going to lead to a lot of change on the landscape, but very difficult to predict. And just an editorial comment, I have been talking quite a bit with people uh, that I know who are involved with range planning, and so far there seems to be very little recognition of climate change in that work. And so I think this is an area that needs to be addressed, and I actually have a project starting up right now where we're going to be doing some of that. Forest uh, species composition and productivity, again, potentially affected by climate change, maybe indirectly through things like drought and changes in the fire regime. But obviously this is critical to the forest industry where we need to get, know about growth and yield and how that might change in the future. We need to know about how species are going to move across the landscape, uh, particularly in the sense of are the products that we're making at a particular facility, a particular mill, uh, are those species still going to be available in proximity to that area? Or are we going to have to physically reorganize ourselves as changes occur on the landscape? For example, if we saw a large increase in fire behavior or fire activity in mixed wood stands, that might tend to encourage hardwood over conifers. And so if you're a conifer uh, user, a sawmill say, then that uh, decrease in conifer cover and increase in hardwoods may not be a good thing for you. So what are the potential responses in, the, in terms of force management to some of those kinds of changes? Productivity may go up or it may go down. Um, I think there are reasons, depending on site conditions, where if you have, let's say, a fairly rich site with a mixed wood forest and you have adequate moisture and nutrients there, then the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere may result in an increase in productivity. That's been shown certainly in, in laboratory conditions, but how that plays out on the landscape is not very well understood. On the other hand, if you've got a crappy jack pine site on sand dunes, then that CO2 fertilization effect is likely not going to occur because those trees are stressed by lack of moisture and poor nutrient status in the soils. So trying to tease out exactly how that balance is going to play out um, whether productivity will increase or decrease is a big question mark, I think, right now, but again, is essential to understand better for the forest industry. All of these things are very difficult to predict. And last but not least, forest communities. Um, you know, we all know that the downturn in the forest sector has resulted in a lot of hardship for rural communities that are linked strongly to the forest sector. And so all of the things that are happening out in the forest will have ripple effects to forest-based communities. They may be directly affected by threats from wildfire, and you are, are all familiar with examples of how that can happen, but also indirectly through impacts on the forest, which may translate into impacts to the forest industry, which in turn will affect communities. But the thing is, of course, that there's a lot more going on out there than just climate change, and so Political change, economic change, as we've seen over the last decade, are also factors affecting forest communities. So once again, I want to emphasize this idea of multiple sources of stress, in this case, for communities, 
that may result in hardships, some of which we've already seen. But again, difficult to predict, um, particularly when you bring in economics and politics. Difficult to say how that's going to play. Okay, so um, as I said, a lot of this is doom and gloom, but what I want to do now for the next few minutes is talk about how can the forest sector respond to some of these things. And this is based on about a 10-year uh, project of which I was part. Uh, Kelvin here in the audience was one of the leaders of this work. And it was a, an, in, an initiative that was fundamentally started by the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers and involved uh, forest practitioners from all of the jurisdictions across Canada. And the idea was to do a lot of work around partly what is the vulnerability of the Canadian forest sector, but I think more important, how do we develop tools for forest managers that allow them to come to grips with the impacts of climate change and help them walk through a procedure of identifying options for adapting to these changes. So that, that's really the, the primary focus of the work. And just generically, we, we refer to this as the CCFM vulnerability approach, vulnerability to climate change. So on the one hand, we know that there are going to be impacts of climate change. I've mentioned a few. You're going to hear a lot more about that over the next couple of days. And we know that we need to do something about it in the form of adaptation. We have to change our practices in a way that allows us to cope effectively with those impacts. So how do we link those two together? How do we go from impacts to adaptation? Well, a miracle isn't going to do it for us. So what we have instead is a system and a complicated flow diagram, of course, which is obligatory for these kinds of talks. But what we have basically is a system that guides forest managers through the process of understanding their organizational readiness to undertake a vulnerability assessment. That's the first box there. Looking at current climate vulnerability, what do you already know about your forest and your forest management system that makes you vulnerable to climate change? What are the experiences you've had relative to things like large fire events, drought impacts, all of the climate related events that have occurred that have affected your uh, ability to continue to deliver sustainable forest management? Flooding events that wash out roads, preventing you from getting wood to the mill, for example, all that kind of stuff. People, almost everyone who works in the forest has had some exposure to those kinds of events and you have a picture in your mind of how that has affected your operations. So we want to start with that in terms of what your direct experience already is. Um, from there we start talking about um, what if those climate events shifted in a particular way? What if fires become more frequent? What if flooding becomes more frequent or occurs earlier in the season, let's say? How does the change in temperature affect road hall limits? Uh, we're dealing with this in Saskatchewan right now. This is not a future thing, this is a today thing, where companies are struggling in some cases to get wood to the mill site because the hall limits on the roads are changing in strange ways or the cut blocks are not frozen so they can't harvest in the winter like they would normally. All of those kinds of operational type uh, impacts are already being felt and so we want to start thinking about how those events might shift in the future and and in order to do that we make reference to things like climate change scenarios or analog climates in other parts of North America that may already be experiencing those things which we expect to occur in the future that kind of thing. So by taking all of that information into account and, and really fundamentally rooting this in people's experience of current climate vulnerability, we start looking at vulnerability assessment. And there's a very highly structured way of walking through understanding what that vulnerability looks like in the context of sustainable forest management. This is specific to Canadian forestry. Um, we want to then, once we understand vulnerability, we want to then try to start identifying options for adaptation. Uh, do we change equipment configurations? Do we change our silvicultural practices? Do we do snow caching of seedlings in the spring? All wide variety of different things. 
uh, which you know I, I can't predict here because it depends so much on local conditions. But the point is that there are options out there for forest managers, and this procedure walks you through a, um, a, a way of trying to identify, identify what those are. And then, of course, as with any planning exercise, we talk about implementing those adaptation options, monitoring to see if they're actually delivering what we hope they did, and then revisiting those things if it turns out that they're not actually doing the, doing the right thing for us. So to summarize all of that, then, we want to understand climate change impacts at the local level. The primary focus of all of this is to work at the local level to understand things from the perspective of force managers. We also want to look at the capacity of the organization to actually implement these adaptation options. Do you have the resources necessary? Do you have the right expertise on hand? Uh, do you have a culture in your organization of being innovative? All of those things play into uh, the success of, of implementing adaptation options, uh, options. And perhaps the most important of all of these things is the need to incorporate this kind of thinking into day-to-day decision-making and planning. I'm working with a PhD student right now who's working with Mystic Management. Some of you may know who that is. It's a forest company in Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan on the western side of the province. And they've just completed a vulnerability assessment following exactly this approach. And the way that they did mainstreaming, which to me is absolutely brilliant, is that they took their standard operating procedures, which drive all of the operational activities that they're responsible for, and every one of those SOPs was interrogated with regard to how does climate change affect this SOP, how can we incorporate adaptation into this SOP, and those documents have now been completed and will be distributed to all of the people in the company because the SOPs are the Bible that tells them how to do their operations. So this to me is the best example I know of of how to mainstream climate change into day-to-day -day operations through their standard operating procedures. So just to kind of summarize this, I want to emphasize that this whole approach is a self-assessment. It's not some external consultant expert going away and doing a bunch of work and bringing it back and saying, bang, here, this is your climate change plan. No, no, no. This is a self-assessment that's done by the company people with guidance from experts where that's required. And it's based on local management objectives, their local landscape, the policy environment in which they operate, and recognizes the role of stakeholder groups in determining what those adaptation options might be. So it's not a top-down external assessment. It's an internal bottom-up assessment that's led by the company or the the government department or whoever it might be. It was designed from the bottom up to be relevant to Canadian sustainable force management practices. So this is not from somewhere else. This is homegrown and, and designed specifically for the way that forestry is practiced in Canada. We have a practitioner's guidebook that is the primary vehicle for assisting people in walking through these assessments, but it's supported by a bunch of other documents some uh, information on how to use scenarios, how to think about assisted migration, and a variety of other things that are relevant to climate change thinking. And I want to identify Jason Edwards with the Canadian Forest Service here in town, who was the primary architect of that guidebook. Um, he was hoping to be here today, but he wasn't able to. Um, and so far, we've seen this applied to, uh, to an FMA, Force Management Agreement area, in western Saskatchewan, as I mentioned, Mystic. And the government of Manitoba, a couple of years ago, did a force management plan for one of their force management units in southeastern Manitoba called the Sandy Lands area, and they also followed this assessment uh, procedure. So we have a couple of examples in our back pocket now of how this can work, and what we really, really need is a whole bunch more of this to be done across the country so that we get a better picture of how this works, how it can be adapted to different parts of the country, different uh, force types, different policy environments, and at, over time we will continue to learn about how vulnerability assessment can assist the force sector in trying to adapt to climate change. So there's lots and lots and lots of information about this. The CCFM website has all of the documents, including the guidebook, freely available for anyone to take a look at. 
A bunch of us are members of the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice, which is run by uh, the University of Sudbury, uh, which is uh, a membership thing which you can sign up and then there are forums and webinars and all kinds of stuff related to adaptation and forestry. And the Canadian Forest Service has an internal program called the Forest Change Program and they are busily, as we speak, posting uh, climate change data, tools for adaptation, uh, all kinds of, of things that will be helpful to forest managers for learning how to adapt to climate change. And finally, just a few acknowledgements. The Forestry Working Group of the Adaptation Platform, some of you may be familiar with that, it's an NRCAN program. Uh, the Forestry Working Group has been instrumental in, in supporting this work, as has funding from the Canadian Forest Service and other parts of NRCAN. Uh, the, province, the provincial and territorial jurisdictions stepped up over the last 10 years and contributed mightily to the development of this approach and, as I said, Jason Edwards was the primary architect of the guidebook and he and I have enjoyed many discussions over a glass of scotch.